Andy? I am. Yeah, just a reminder, I, probably you all know, all these brown bag sessions are being recorded, and as premium site members, you can go out and review any of them anytime you'd like. Uh, someone had suggested, I'm not sure who, but someone had suggested that we do a brown bag on simultaneous requirements. And as I was thinking about it, I realized that this is pretty confusing to a lot of folks. A lot of folks miss it. And it almost seems like there's a, a little bit of a conflict there because this does override uh, a statement that we have in the standard. So uh, before we get into it, though, I just thought I'd ask this question. Uh, do the pair of flats and the key seats, we've got a pair of flats here, they're 12 plus minus 0.1, positioned to A. A is this large diameter, maybe it rides in a, a bearing in the assembly, and so we've called that out. And, and so we're saying this pair of flats center plane if you go by the, the center plane interpretation, uh, center plane has to be on datum axis A. And then we come over to this key seat, and the key seat also has to be centered on A. Now, the key seat and the pair of flats are shown at 90 degrees to one another. So my question is, do they have to pass this gauge and maintain their orientation according to this drawing? even though we only have A referenced. Um, anybody want to voice their thoughts? I can tell you what I do when I get one like this, Don. <laughs> what and that is, I make, I make one of those things a datum, and then I clock to it. Well, I hope you make it a datum feature, not a datum. A datum I, thank you. That is correct. <laughs> I appreciate your exactness. Oh, I... I Pick pepper out of fly poop sometimes. Sorry about that. But, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, and that is certainly an option. Uh, we might take this uh, key seat width and make it datum feature B. And then, absolutely, we could say over here that this has to be positioned to A, B. And then it would remove all doubt. And so in this particular case, that would be a very good idea. But uh, back to the question. If I don't have one of these as datum feature B, do they have to meet their tolerances simultaneously as is illustrated in this gauge? Would your gauge be uh, bigger than 11.9, Don? Uh, oh, 12.1. Yeah, let me fix that. I made up this gauge real fast before this seminar started, and you're absolutely right. That was really to see if anybody was paying attention. So, yeah, internal, external, sometimes I get confused, but thank you. Okay, uh, so back to the question. And no one's going to say, well, what's that? I said now I'd use that gauge. You would, you would use this gauge, this gauge is required, and, and you'd be absolutely correct. But let's walk through why. <clears throat> Certainly there's times when you'd want to have a relationship between those features. If I have a timing gear here and a, a cam on the pair of flats and I'm worried about their orientation, uh, I definitely want them to be oriented as shown on the drawing. But then there's other times. If I had a friction disc on the pair of flats and a V-pulley and the only reason for the flats and the key seat is to transmit torque, I really wouldn't care if their orientation was held. And I've had customers that have, um, you know, maybe a five-foot-long shaft where they have features on both ends, and it would be a real pain if you had to maintain that orientation. They have to machine one end, flip the shaft around, and then machine the other because it's so large. So uh, it could go either way, and, and we have this rule. Now, before we even look at the rule, I'll tell you that uh, whenever you come, against a, come upon a default rule, in the standard. What you need to keep in mind is who wrote the standard or, and who continues to work on the development of the standard and it's mainly people from design. So whenever there's a question of which way they should go with a default rule, you know, they're, they're asking themselves the question, should we default to something that would be easy for production or should we default to something that covers our tail? And you can probably guess which way they go every time. As you think about our rules, like rule, rule two, which is regardless of feature size, that's more restrictive than using an M or an L. Rule number one, certainly restrictive on how we measure size, and definitely this rule simultaneous requirements. 
So as I look at this drawing, though, I notice that the key seat and the flats are shown uh, at 90 degrees to one another, and we're told that there's an implied 90 degree basic angle there. But if we look at 274 of the standard, it says that size doesn't control the orientation or location relationships between individual features. Features shown perpendicular, which is the case here, coaxial or symmetrical to each other, must be toleranced for location orientation or the drawing's incomplete. So that would suggest that I've left off an orientation control between these two. So what is the real answer? You know, do I have to control the orientation of that? Well, up in the datum section, we have 4.19, simultaneous requirements. And simultaneous requirement is where two or more geometric tolerances apply as a single pattern on a part. And simultaneous requirements applies to only position and profile. Those are the only two this applies to. If they're located by basic dimensions. Now, these features are located because there's an implied zero basic between their center planes and the axis. That's stated in the standard. And we also have that implied 90 degrees basic. And they are related to common datum features. Well, in this case, it's only one datum feature, A. And those datum features are referenced in the same order of precedence at the same boundary condition, which in this case is regardless of material boundary. So the answer to the question is, because of simultaneous requirements, since they have the same datum feature reference, yes, they have to meet their tolerances simultaneously. And a gauge like this, <clears throat> is necessary, <laughs> or something similar. You can simulate this gauge, certainly. Any questions so far on that? This, this rule goes uh, a bit further, so I, I thought in this brown bag I'd, I'd take you uh, through uh, uh, where else this rule applies. So just to reemphasize, though, in the case of my timing gear and cam, I don't have to do anything more here. John, was it John or Perry? One of you said, this John. Make, John, make one of the features date and feature B. You certainly could. But as it stands, the drawing is fine uh, because they both reference A. Probably on that part, I'd do the same thing, though, John. So features and patterns of features with the same datum reference are a pattern, according to the standard. Now, to help you remember this, you know, I look at that datum feature reference here at the end of the feature control frame, and I kind of think of it as like the last name. You know, they have the same last name, and so they're a family. They're connected. Uh, they are a pattern. So that might be a, an easy way for you to help people remember this simultaneous requirements rule. So are both of these acceptable parts according to this drawing? And the answer would be nope. This is the one right here that looks like it meets the drawing. This one definitely doesn't. If I want to override this rule, and you know we have ways to override all of our rules, well, in this case, we have to do something overt on the drawing. I have to say SEPREQT for separate requirement from anybody else with that same data and feature reference. And the same here. So then if a part came in as illustrated here, that would be perfectly fine. And for my friction disk and V-pulley, I'd be happy with that. And I'm clicking and waiting for my computer to wake up. There we go. There's really three ways to create patterns three common ways. One is using the quantity symbol. Hey, uh, repeating features. Yes. Uh, Perry has a question. Yeah. Uh, Don, can you go back one slide, please? Sure. When you put separate requirement on there, does, does the relationship between those two slots, does that default back to a title block? We have like plus or minus one degree in our title block. Would that be restricted or can it be be anywhere 360 degrees around there once I put the separate requirement node in there. Well, I, I'm not thrilled about your general title block tolerance because I'd say one degree from where? How do you set it up? Do you set it up on the, 
the flats and measure the key seat or vice versa. And I guess I'd say I'm not sure. But I really don't the, know. The question is because it's shown, the, the Duodia said where it's shown at 90 degrees, it is 90 degrees basic. Right. So then when you do the separate requirement, then then this is the fall back to the title blocks is plus or minus one degree or can it be rotated 30 degrees? Is there there is no limitation once you have separate requirements when you undo that? Is that well here's the problem, Perry, and it seems like I'm hedging here, but you know, we don't explain what plus minus tolerances mean other than for size. So when you have a general plus minus tolerance, whether it's a linear or angular tolerance, you're really on your own. I, I'm not gonna pretend uh, to say this is what it means. The standard didn't address it, so I, we had that question come up here, and I told him that just unlocks it, you can do anything you want because there's nothing that talks about title blocks. Yeah, um, that, that would so be I, my, uh, I guess, understanding, and I'd, I'd say it's risky. If you're concerned, you better do something about it. And of course, the other, the other side of that is you have that one degree, that's pretty restrictive. So if you really don't care and you said separate requirements and it goes to the shop, they might think, I have to hold it with the one degree. Uh, you're paying more for those parts than you need to. That's exactly what they did. They said it had to, once I put separate requirement on it, they said now it's plus or minus one degree, and they said no, it's not. Well, they made that up because there's no standard to support that. that we really don't what know I what that. I can yeah, make the we don't know what that angular tolerance and we don't know what it means. <laughs> okay, All right. Thank I mean, you. They're they're out there, and you know they're slowly going away. Thank goodness. But a, a great question, Perry. But based on the Thank standard, God. I can't give you an answer. So th there's nothing to back them up. I guess is maybe the way to say it. So to get a pattern, I can give you a, a quantity symbol. Uh, indicate the quantity of repeating features, or I can use this principle of simultaneous requirements, or I can put a note on the drawing to tie things together. And if you're familiar with our training, this is this is out of our training. Um, this drawing has all three types of methods to get a pattern. So before we take a look at these, uh, I'll just show you what the assembly might look like. I have this stepped shaft going through this larger hole and piloting into that smaller hole. So it's important that I keep these holes in line. So you see up here, I have said two coaxial holes because they had different sizes. I couldn't put the position tolerance next to one of them. That wouldn't have been right. So I've said two coaxial holes, and I'm telling you that they can move around 0.4 on the part, but they have to be in position at zero at M with respect to each other. And if you're not real solid with composite tolerancing, uh, you might have noticed we posted a tip recently. In fact, a series of three tips are getting posted on composite tolerancing to help explain this. So one way to get a pattern is to use a note like this to tie features together. The second way is this quantity symbol, 2x, so whatever follows applies to both holes. I have one hole here and one hole here. And so this is saying that they have to have a size of 3, plus or minus 0.2, and they have to be in position within 0.4, and together they are datum feature D. This is what we call a linear extruded type of feature. When you have parallel holes like this, whether it's two holes or, or ten holes, if you call them out as a datum feature, the pattern as a datum feature, that would be a, a linear extrusion. The uh, third way is we have three holes here that have the same datum reference, A, B, C, and M. And over here we have A, B, C, and M. So these two holes and this hole are a pattern, and they must meet their tolerances simultaneously. So if we look at maybe building a gauge for this, and I hope everybody knows, even though I, I often use gauges to help explain concepts, doesn't mean you have to build gauges. You can simulate it. You can use your CMM, your vision system. Uh, please don't think I'm saying you have to build a gauge, but it helps to visualize, I think. So here I've picked up uh, A. Feature A will establish a plane, and the same with feature uh, B back here. 
And then it says to use C at its max material boundary. So I might have a little block in here, and the max material boundary would be the smallest slot, which would be 9.9, .9 minus nothing. I have to take a look at that geometric tolerance so that I don't violate datum precedence. And that's why we say we don't say max material condition here. We say max material boundary when it's on the datum feature. So uh, that would be at 10 minus 0.1 minus nothing, or 9.9. .9. So I'd have to make full contact on A, then slide up against B, and then the part could shift left and right. So if I now had some gauge pins to check those holes, and let me zoom in on those if I can here. Okay, it looks like that if I shift the part to the left, those two smaller pins will go in the holes, but the upper one, the larger holes gauge pin won't go. But if I shift the part to the right, the upper one would go. So the question is, is that OK? Can I check the two holes by sliding the part one way and then shift the part the other way to check the other one? And we now know that because of simultaneous requirements, the answer is no. So if we look at another part here, now it looks like I could shift the part to the left, and I think all three of those gauge pins would go. So this would be an acceptable part. Any question there? Uh, just a comment. Nate okay. uh, said that he's yep. having a hard time comment. hearing other people talk. He can hear you fine, but when other people ask a question. So if anybody has a question, if you could repeat it before you answer it, that would be helpful. I certainly can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Now, the standard says that the simultaneous requirements rule applies to profile and to position. So looking at a part like this gasket, I notice I have a statement here that untoleranced dimensions are basic. So all these dimensions are basic except for that 10 millimeter diameter up there. And I'd have to check that separately following rule one. In other words, full form check at 9.8 and two point measurements at 10.2. But then, as far as this profile and this smaller profile around the inside, all this contiguous geometry on the inside, because that says all around, and this position tolerance would all have to meet their tolerances simultaneously. So what I envision is a one millimeter band around here, a 0.5 millimeter band around the inside, and because we have the max material condition applied to the tolerance, it is saying there is a boundary that I can't violate. And that boundary would be at 9.8 minus 0.5 or 9.3. So this doesn't show up quite as well as I'd hoped it would, but I, I'm showing you those tolerance zones now, the millimeter around the outside, the 0.5 on the inside, and then the boundaries that I can't violate with the holes. So this would be a real good candidate for uh, inspection with something like an optical comparator. Hope everybody's familiar with optical comparators. If you're not, uh, we have a penny down here, and this one has nice surface illumination. So you see the penny up here on the screen. We can take our part and we can magnify it and look at a shadow of it. And let's say I magnify it at four times size. I could make an overlay on maybe a material like mylar at four times size and see if the part fits the overlay. And we're once again waiting for my computer to wake up. There we go. So this might be my overlay. And as I look at a shadow of the part, as long as everybody fits the profiles and the holes don't violate those boundaries, it's a good part. Now, could I, let me go back here, I'm reluctant to because my computer's acting a little slow here. But could I have added a B and a C here? Could I have made this width B? and maybe this height C, and then said everybody's got to be positioned to ABC. And, and I could have. The answer is sure. But if I know how this is going to be checked, uh, this is a perfectly acceptable method for checking this gasket. Now, where does the simultaneous requirement rule not apply? Well, it doesn't apply to the lower segment of a composite tolerance. 
So as we look at this part, I have two little bosses here. They're used for alignment or location of the mating part. And I have positioned them on my part within point 0.4 to ABC. Let's see, A is this face, B is this width, and C is this inside width here. So I've located them within point 0.4 on the part, but I've also said that they have to be positioned zero at their small, or pardon me, at their largest size and perpendicular to A. Now I also have two tapped holes, probably for a couple of screws, and we come down here and see that they also have to be positioned within 0.4 on the part, and this tolerance is projected up into the mating part, because I really don't care where the holes are, I want to know where they're going to put the screws, because those screws will act like a couple more bosses on this part when I put them in there. And then I have this position tolerance of 0.1 projected, eight millimeters with respect to A. So it's controlling the two tapped holes to each other and perpendicular to A. But I don't have anything tying these two patterns together. If we look at the assembly, I have a cover coming down and locating with a hole and a slot on the two pins. And then these are some nice clearance holes and I'm going to put a couple of cap screws in there to hold this in place. So I really would like to tie the four features together as a pattern. Since the uh, simultaneous requirements rule doesn't apply to the lower segments, I'd have to write SIMREQT on these two lower, they say following the lower segments, to tie them together as a pattern. So now they would have to meet the 0.1 and the zero tolerances simultaneously. Now another place where you might want to think a little bit about simultaneous requirements is when we're talking about planar datum features. I often get the question, well what if my planar datum feature, like this one right here, if you recall from the drawing we looked at of this part, uh, this was datum feature B. But what if it's, you know, it's, it's convex, like I'm showing here, so when I put it up against my setup, it can rock. Well, the math standard deals with this and it tells us that there is a candidate datum set. And what they mean by that is there's really an infinite number of possible planes that you could use as you rock this part. And so you can, you can pick any one of those planes, but because of simultaneous requirements, once you pick one of those planes, if everybody on this part is to A, B, and in this case C, then you can rock it but you have to find a position where all of the features will meet their tolerances simultaneously. So one more place where simultaneous requirements might kick in, or would kick in. So that's how far reaching the simultaneous requirements is, and I, I wanted to mention the rule and mention some areas that it affects. So that was only about a half hour for this brown bag, but I'd, I'd like to stop now and ask if uh, anybody has any questions about it. Okay, well, since I have the, the loyal ones <laughs> attending, uh, we find a lot of other people go out and do look at these later on, but they uh, often don't attend. Um, curious, does somebody have a topic they're looking for for the next brown bag? While they're thinking, I just wanted to let you know that Frank Rodriguez uh, did join us, so hi, Frank. Frank Rodriguez or Frank Roderick? Roderick, sorry. Hi, Frank. Is he muted, Wendy? Uh, I think Frank never can actually talk to us. So, yes, he said hello. He's typing to me. So, he said hello. Okay. Okay. So, does anyone have a, a topic they'd like to suggest for a future brown bag or any questions about simultaneous requirements? Okay. Well, uh, that's the end of this brown bag. I would encourage you, though, if, if you have anything you're struggling with, you'd like to see more coverage of. I, I, I really encourage you to email me or Wendy, you know, email our site. If you want to email me directly and you don't have it, it's uh, on. Yeah? 
Perry has a question, and Frank suggested datum targets. Uh oh. Hmm. Do I want to talk about datum targets? That's a tough one. <laughs> no, that's a good one. And I wish I could print. Frank says, yes, you do. And Perry still has a question. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah Perry, I, my yeah. question wasn't on, on your, your topic today, but you had an illustration there. I would like to ask you a question about the tangent plane modifier. And that is, if you have a concave surface like you showed in your in your uh, picture that you had, the, uh, the slide before, last week, go back one, if you could. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's say that the bottom of your part was the datum, and then I, I wanted to say a parallel that top surface that had a tangent plane modifier on it. But I also be able to pick because your your tangent plane, you could have several different tangent planes. Would it would it allow you just to move that to you find one of the tangent planes that fits the requirement? Wow, uh, I'm amazed that that question has never been asked, and I'm quite certain that we don't address it in the Y fourteen five standard. Um, because you could have that condition that you show right there in your part. You know, mm -hmm. If I want to run parallelism to the to the bottom as my datum A, then I could rock my tangent plane because be several tangent planes. You're right. You're absolutely right. And um, I I don't have a good answer for you. Boy, love these questions that stump me here. But um, I I don't recall seeing it, any discussion of that in 14.5. And uh, does anyone know if the math standard even addressed that? Because I'm not aware of it. So that's that's a real good question. Now, of course, there's there's some things you can do, like you can you can put a note on your drawing that says uh, may not be convex or must be concave. You know, I, I've seen notes like that before. Right. So Was there another comment? Question, it's not really an hour. I just I don't wonder where to look for a direction to find an answer to it. Yeah, and I didn't repeat the question. Uh, the, for those that might not have heard it, the question was, what if uh, this bottom surface down here was my datum feature? He said datum, but he meant datum feature. <laughs> and I was uh, putting, a, let's say, a profile tolerance on this surface, and I modified it with the tangent plane. There would really be several different possible tangent planes there, and would I be allowed to just rock it to find one that would fit the tolerance zone? The 14.5 standard, I don't believe, addresses that anywhere, and I, I also don't think that the math standard does. So it's, that's an excellent question. I, I wonder how many people out there are, are actually using the tangent plane modifier. That was something that was requested by GM years ago, and I just don't see it going on drawings. Anybody using it? Nate says, I have used non-uniform profile to control. But even if you use a non-uniform profile, um, and that's non-uniform or unilateral, but e either one, um, the surface itself within the tolerance zone could still uh, be convex. Let me think about that. If he uses a non-uniform, So maybe on the drawing, I don't know, is he making it concave? And then what do I do with this other side of the... What do I do this other side of the... Other side of the... Oh. <laughs> I unmuted him for a second to see if he could answer it, but he'll have to type to me and I'll have to tell you what he says. I like the echo, though. Okay. Yeah. But but the point is, even if you use the non-uniform, where maybe I, I show the, the lower side of the zone as, as curved uh, concave, and the upper part I just use a uh, straight line, 
you still could, within your tolerance zone, perhaps have, you know, a little bit of a rocker. That's that's interesting. Something else I'd have to play with. Boy, great discussions here. Good thing there's a meeting coming up here in a couple weeks. Oh, I don't dare bring this stuff up in the meeting. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just, I'll just mention, uh, anybody, I, I mentioned the meeting coming up in San Diego week after next, but the uh, public is invited, you know, if you want to be there. Uh, I wasn't able to attend the last meeting, and so they sort of put some of my stuff on, on hold. I have the profile section, and I have three pretty major presentations that I'll be giving at that meeting. So if, if anybody uh, can make it, you, and you're interested in profile, you might enjoy the meeting, and San Diego is a wonderful place to, to visit, certainly. Um, any more comments? Yes, Don, you yeah. suggested questions for, for future brown bags. Yes. Um, one of the new things in the standard is uh, selectively restraining degrees of freedom. And I am continually, when looking at drawings, going through the six degrees of freedoms and page 50 out of the book showing which features or types of geometrics features control which degrees of freedom and trying to keep these things straight in my head. <laughs> um, I'm not efficient and fast at it yet. Dean Watts is an individual that seems to be really quick on this stuff. Uh, he, but, but, and probably you are too. But I uh, am not efficient at analyzing the degrees of freedom, and I'm I'm searching for an application on a drawing uh, where I would be constraining individual degrees of freedom uh, and having a great success. You know, you know, having a having a win on a drawing by doing so, and I just struggle with the implementation of it because I'm not good at it yet. Okay, I'm I'm with you. Um, so you'd like to see examples? Is that where you're Well, going? like an application. I know people struggle with this. They struggle with datums in general and what is controlled. And now when we go in and specify which of the six degrees of freedom each datum in a feature control frame is going to control, it's really hard for most people to keep track of. And examples, okay. successful examples of this, uh, would would help implement a new feature in the standard. Okay, I, I will point out that um, we did have a brown bag session. We entitled it "Violating Datum Precedence," which was on how to customize your datum reference framework. And in there, I had a, a couple of examples. Uh, one was a, oh, it was a disk, and the disk had a key seed in it, but it also had a hex. And the hex, it's supposed to be in the middle, but the hex was there to transmit torque. So uh, let's say that this surface right here was your primary datum feature. And so then I called out the hex as secondary. Well, because it's a hex, it would take away rotation as well as left, right, up, down. And for that particular design where we had a bunch of holes around here, we didn't want the hex to take away mm -hmm. the rotation. We wanted the key seat to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a, a place where you customize the data reference frame. And another one was a, a cone for like a tool holder. And the cone was called out as your primary datum feature, which would put your origin out here someplace. But we wanted to reset the origin to this face. Uh, for setting the depth of tools. Oh, I have some tools that I'm going to put in here. So that was another one where we customized the datum reference frame. One where um, I run into it is we can now use any feature as a datum feature. Well, if you have some curved surface, complex curved surface, and you run into this molded plastic parts, and I'll tell you another place you run into it is the hood of your car. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to try and draw the hood of a car, but 
you know, we have this, this very stylized here hood of our car, and I may have a whole lot of datum targets along here to trap this thing. And if you look at that complex surface, it really could constrain six degrees of freedom. However, because it's so shallow, it might not do a good job of constraining, let's say, that motion or this motion, those translations. So I would want to uh, release those degrees of freedom and constrain them with some other features. So there, there's a few examples, but I certainly can give that some thought, John. Okay. Um. I like it. I like it. So I, <laughs> I'll mull that one over. Any others? I, 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 I will try and um, see if I can access those that I have missed. Thank you. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, take a look at that one. Violating datum precedence. Okay, well, others have had a chance to think a little bit more about it. Any other questions, comments, suggestions from anyone? For those that don't know, the figure on page 81 in the standard that is uh, the hood example that you were talking about, uh, uh, Pat McQuistian tells me that's the, neon, the hood of a neon. Yes. And I brought up that that really uh, constrains more degrees of freedom than they're suggesting in that figure. And Archie told me to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to talk about it. But well, seriously, people they, tell me that at my job often also. All the time, yeah. <laughs> yes. What is it, the expression? Just like here at home, you know, go lay by your dish. Be quiet and go lay by your dish. So. Uh, anyone else? Any other comments, questions? Nobody's typing anything, so I don't have anything from the people who can't talk. Okay. All right. So I guess that concludes this brown bag session.